Hi everybody, Ryan Jackson here. Hope you're doing well. We're going to quickly talk about power over Ethernet and the requirements in the National Electrical Code. This will be based on the 2020 version of the NEC, and there actually were a couple of changes from the 2017 to the 2020 NEC, uh, mainly some explanatory material and some clarifications, but we also changed the ampacity of the cables for almost every type of application. So if you're familiar with the requirements in the 2017, uh, nothing earth shattering happened in 2020, although there were some clarifications and again the, uh, the ampacities of the cables were all revised as well. So if we look at it historically in the NEC, uh, we've never really dealt with power over Ethernet or uh, cables that supply both power and data until the 2017 version of the code because, as some of my friends like to say, you need to stay relevant. And the NEC never had to address it before because the technology is relatively new. But this new technology is something that we need to understand and, and quite frankly, I think electricians need to embrace. I'm rather concerned and a lot of people are, that commercial electricians are going to find themselves out of the lighting business before too long unless we choose to keep ourselves in that business. So as the technologies evolve, the code evolves to keep up, but just as importantly, you need to evolve and you need to stay up with it as well. When I was wearing the tools, I didn't want to know anything about installations over 480. Uh, I, don't, I didn't care about medium voltage or high voltage. I didn't care about customer on substations. That was just something that I didn't want to hear about because I was comfortable in my own little world. I also didn't want to know anything about systems that were lower than 120 volts. So I had my own little bubble, 120 volts through 480 volts, pretty much commercial, didn't really do any residential. I did some industrial stuff, but I was more 120 through 480. And I think today's electricians need to come to grips with the fact that people like me are dinosaurs. Uh, you either evolve or you die, as they say. And I think part of the evolution of being an electrician is embracing lower and lower voltages. So let's talk about the requirements then. We added these rules in the 2017 NEC because of power over Ethernet and mainly power over Ethernet lighting, which is becoming fairly popular. So the primary concern of why we had to add this in the NEC, and it, it is low voltage and it's low current. So if it's both limited in the power and the, the voltage and the current, then why are we so concerned about it? Well, the main issue here is reducing the threat of fire that can arise from multiple bundled cables. Um, I mentioned that we tweaked these requirements a bit in the 2020 code, but again, for the most part, if you're already familiar with them, you won't see that too much has changed. So 725.144 is where we begin, and that's cables for power and data. Class two or class three circuits that transmit both power and data must comply with A and B. The conductors have to be copper and the current must not exceed the rating of the connectors. All right, now we're going to kind of take that line by line so that we're all quite familiar with it. It starts out by saying class two and class three circuits. All right, well, what's a class two or a class three circuit? It's important to remember that class two and class three circuits are discussed in article 725, but they're defined in article 100. So for a class two circuit, it's wiring between a class two power source and the uh, equipment that it connects to. And these circuits are considered safe as it relates to both electric shock and fire. All right, so Article 725 covers remote control circuits, signaling circuits, and power limited circuits. Now, here in the photograph, we have a garage door opener. And if you can see, it's marked NEC Class 2. This is actually listed as a Class 2 power source. So the wiring between the source and the equipment that it connects to must be a class two circuit. Now, this is a remote control circuit, again, regulated by Article 725. And that means the circuit between the opener and the push button on the wall would be remote control because I'm controlling the garage door opener circuit through a relay or equivalent. And it's supplied by a class two power source because it says class two. 
And in fact, when you go to 725.121, it actually says it's not really a class two circuit unless the power source is marked class two. Now, it can also be marked as an information technology equipment power source. That is also a class two source. But for the most part, you have a class two circuit when you have a power source that says class two. Similarly, we have a class three circuit, and that's the wiring between a class three power source and its supplied equipment. And these circuits are considered safe as it relates to fire and safe enough as it relates to electric shock. We can get some higher voltages with class three circuits. Therefore, we don't quite have the same amount of safety as it relates to electric shock that we would have with a class two circuit. However, by limiting the voltage and the current, we consider a class three circuit safe from fire and safe enough as it relates to electric shock. Now, class three circuits are somewhat unusual. Um, a class three circuit, a very common example would be a nurse call system. But usually when it comes to limited energy circuits, they're typically class two, but you can get some class three as well. Now, this is a table in the back of the codebook, uh, table 11B in chapter nine. Now I'm using table B because we're gonna be talking about direct current. So these are the power limitations for a class two or a class three power source. And you can see that the voltage can go up to 20 volts in, uh, for currents of eight amps or less. And as we go up into higher voltages, then the currents start to get lower and lower. And in fact, down here at the bottom, you can see that the power source for zero to 20 uh, volts, the, the uh, power limitations is five times the maximum voltage. So that would be 100 watts. If I have 20 to 30 volts, well, then I've got some different, you know, that we're, we're starting to increase the voltage, which means we're increasing the shock. Although at 30 volts, we're still not very concerned about electric shock. So not much changes at that point. Once I get over 30 volts, up to 60 volts, now we've definitely added some danger of electric shock. So we're really going to start caring about the power limitations. And then I can go up to 150 volts on a class two circuit, but take a look at the current. It's 0 0.005 amps. So we limit both the voltage and the current. So we limit the overall power and that's why we would call it a power limited circuit. Class two is considered safe from both, both shock and fire. And then as we look at class three, class three is 60 to 100 volts and the wattage is limited based on the voltage range. But either way, we're going to limit it to the point where it's safe from fire and safe enough that it's not going to cause a fatal electrocution. Uh, it could shock you, but not kill you, and to be perfectly honest, probably not really even harm you. But there is an increased shock danger, so we do wanna recognize that it does exist. So that would be our class two and class three power sources. So going back to the rule, 725.144, class two or class three circuits that transmit both power and data must comply with A and B. All right, let's take a look here. Here we have a single port power over ethernet power source. The input is 120 volts and the output is 56 volts and one half of one amp. So low voltage and low current. This is a class two power source. And in fact, it says down here, it's a listed ITE power supply. This is considered a class two power source. The conductors have to be copper and the current must not exceed the rating of the connectors. These are some concepts that should not be new to us. Okay, the conductors have to be copper. Fair enough, we're talking about twisted pair cable. Uh, pretty doubtful that you would make those in aluminum. So the conductors have to be copper. That's gonna satisfy itself. The uh, current must not exceed the rating of the connectors. Well, that's the same concept that we use when we're sizing conductors for electric light and power. Um, the terminals might have a lower failing point than the conductors between them. Forget 
class 2 and class 3 for a minute, and let's talk about 120 volts. If I've got my circuit breaker, some 12 gauge wire, and a receptacle, my 12 gauge wire might be rated 90 degrees. Now can I put 90 degrees worth of current on that wire? The answer is no, because my circuit breaker and my receptacle might only be rated for 75 degrees or even 60 degrees C worth of heat. So I could not put more than 60 degrees worth of heat on the wire, not because the wire would fail, but because the terminations would fail. So that's something that we've been doing for a very long time in the NEC. If you're familiar with 110.14C and 310.15 and table 310.16, that's something that I'm sure you've done several times. So the current must not exceed the rating of the connectors. Easy enough. That's just kind of a general requirement. Here's an example of some power over ethernet lighting. Up here we have the actual power source and then we've got some twisted pair that are supplying these luminaires and that's it. There is just a single twisted pair like a, a, a cat5 cable or a cat6 cable going to those lights and that's it. And that's what has so many electricians concerned is that the the quote the low voltage guys whoever those might be are going to take over our jobs as electricians. Well, I'm here to tell you that your job as an electrician probably needs to include low voltage if you want to stay relevant. So, this is a power over ethernet installation. Um, one of the concerns that I have with this picture, and it's not addressed in the code yet, is we have all of these screws penetrating the, uh, penetrating the roof. And believe it or not, that's not a violation yet for this type of installation. I think it probably should be, but uh, 300.4E does not apply to a class two or a class three circuit. So we don't have to follow the normal inch and a half separation rule from the metal corrugated sheet roof decking. So believe it or not, uh, this is not a violation, not the best looking installation that I've ever seen, but it is considered safe. So as of right now, it's compliant. Let's keep going. There's an informational note, in fact, there's a half dozen of them. The first one says that the cable supplying a closed circuit TV camera could be an example of a cable that transmits both power and data. All right, now, in the example that I used here, I'm showing a cable that is not a twisted pair cable. So this is not a power over ethernet installation. So not every closed circuit TV camera is a power over ethernet, you know, TV camera, but some of them could be. So our informational note tells us that. The next informational note is, is quite useful. It says the 8P8C connector, and I think that's eight pins, eight contacts. I know it's eight pins. I think it's eight contacts uh, connector, which I always just called an RJ45, right? So the big phone connector. The 8P8C connector is common for power over ethernet, and most importantly, the product standard limits their rating to one ampere at 60 degrees. Now that is some really useful information. If I have to make sure that I'm not putting more current on these, con on these cables than what their connectors can handle, then I'd better know what the connectors can handle. And for a PoE system, an 8P8C, the answer is, one amp. Another informational note, this one was added in the 2020, tells us that these requirements are based on four pair balanced twisted pair cables. All right, so UTP is unshielded twisted pair, four pairs, right? So we've got four, P, four PR, four pairs, unshielded twisted pair, type CMR, communications riser rated, 75 degrees C, I think we're all familiar with, uh, with what 75 degrees C is. And then over on the left, to the left of the circle, it says 23 gauge. And reading the, uh, the cable jacket and deciphering what these letters and numbers mean is actually something that we're going to have to do to comply with the requirements of 725.144. So understanding what those different numbers are is, is actually fairly important. The next informational note, tells us to take a peek at a particular ANSI NEMA standard for information about power over ethernet lighting. 
All right, so this is a PoE power source, and you can see that the output is 21 volts uh, with 23 watts per port, and that is for our power over Ethernet lighting. So, you know, with LEDs, how many, uh, how many lamps can you get off of one of these drivers? Well, it, it depends on, you know, the size of the lamps and the size of the driver, of course. Here's where the rules really kind of kick in. When they first added this in 2017, I was a little bit confused because with class two and class three, they're considered safe from fire and safe enough from electric shock. And I was kind of thinking, well, why are we adding all of these requirements about cables if you can't kill somebody and you can't light a fire with it? And the answer to that is, well, you can't light a fire with one power limited circuit. I'll, I'll, I'll stand by that. I mean, that's what the definition says and I agree. But what happens if I put one amp on a whole bunch of individual wires and then group a massive bundle of cables together? Well, the heat in the center of that bundle of cables is going to be pretty significant, enough that it could potentially melt the insulation of the surrounding cables and conductors and then end up having a fire and lighting the building on fire. So the concern is cable bundling. And it says the ampacity of class 2 or class 3 balanced twisted pair cables is determined using table 725.144 for ambient temperatures up to 86 degrees F. All right, so as we look at the table, there's a table here for one through seven cables in a bundle, eight through 19 cables in a bundle, 20 to 37 cables in a bundle, and if you have your code book open, you'll see that it goes even farther than that. Then we've got our temperature rating, 60, 75, or 90 degrees C. Let's go ahead and do an example really quick. If I've got a bundle, of 15 cables and they're all this cable here in the photograph. That is a what? 75 degree C, four pair, 23 gauge. All right, so I go down the size here on the left, 23 gauge, 75 degree column. I said we had 15 of them in a bundle. That means I could put what? 1.11 amps on each individual piece of copper in that cable. However, the connectors are only going to be rated one amp. Is that correct? So we would have to make sure that we're not putting more than one amp through this cable, not because the cable's going to melt, but because the connectors could. And as we go across, you can see that the number of cables in the bundle, as that goes up, the ampacity goes down. It's really no different than the way we handle MC cable or the number of wires in a piece of EMT. Look, if you have a bunch of wires or cables or conductors that are bundled together, then we have to decrease the ampacity. There's also a table note that says for bundles of more than 192 cables or for conductors that are smaller than 26 gauge, the ampacity has to be calculated using engineering supervision. 192 cables is a pretty big bundle. But let's be honest, some of us have been in some older buildings where we've been remodeling, you know, indefinitely for the last 50 years, and you get some pretty crazy cable bundles. You know, a bundle of more than 192 cables isn't beyond the realm of possibility. So if we have that, and they're carrying both power and data, then we would need to get some engineering supervision to help us figure out the ampacity. The other table note tells us that if only half the conductors in the cable are carrying current, so maybe two for, for uh, current and then two for the data, then the ampacity can be increased by 140%. Now that's the ampacity of the cable. That does not change the rating of the connector. If the connector is only rated one amp, that's usually going to be the limiting factor. So I would tell you not to get too carried away about that because I think in most installations, it's the connector that's the weakest link. It also says that for temperatures greater than 86 degrees F, the correction factors in 310.15b apply. So just like THHN and XHHW and everything else, the ampacity is based on a maximum of 86 degrees F. 
If it's higher, then the ampacity decreases using the correction factors in 310.15b. So same concept that we have for conductors and light and power, we're applying to power over ethernet. There is an exception, and, and this was added in the 2020, and it needed to be. It says, look, for loads of 0.3 amps or less, cables with 24 gauge or larger condu uh, conductors do not need to comply with any of this. So, look, if your load is 0 0.3 amps, then forget it. We're not gonna be killing anybody with that small amount of current. We're not gonna be lighting fire, so we can just ignore it altogether. The last thing is 725.144B, which talks about a dash LP cable. Now, I know that there is a, a dash LP cable out there that's listed. Uh, as of today, which is January of 2021, as of today, I'm not sure that you can even buy it yet, but there is a listed version of it out there. For class two or class three cables that have the suffix dash LP, for those cables, those are designed to be installed in a bundle. And you can just go right off the marked ampacity of the cable, regardless of how many uh, cables are in a bundle. So it's designed to be bundled together, just go right off the rating, or if the rating is lower than what the table would allow, then you can go off the table. But what I wanna point out here is the suffix dash LP, not just LP, but dash LP, and I know that's frustrating, but if you can look at this rather blurry picture here, this cable has three different markings, CMP, CL3P, FPLP. So that means it's a communications cable that's plenum rated. It's also listed as a class three plenum rated cable, and it's also listed FPLP for fire, power limited, so power limited fire alarm cable, and it's plenum rated. So the fact that it ends with the letters LP does not make it a dash LP cable. It would have to say like FPLP dash LP. So again, they do make that cable. I've never seen it, but from my understanding, you, it, it should be on the market pretty quickly. All right, with that said, we're going to wrap it up. I hope you guys are staying safe out there in the COVID-19 era. Hopefully we're getting towards the end of that. But if you're interested, uh, head over to my website for books. Follow me on Instagram, Ryan Jackson Electrical. Facebook, Ryan Jackson Electrical, uh, Ryan Jackson Electrical Training. And YouTube, Ryan Jackson Electrical. Make sure you like, subscribe, and do all of those wonderful things. Uh, but most importantly, have a great day.